Good morning. Good to be together this morning. A couple things I want to highlight from the bulletin. Uh, this was our last Sunday to have that middle service, that 10-15 service. So uh, the schedule for time uh, moving forward is there in your bulletin. You can take a look at that. Next Sunday, so uh, Scott and I are up at conference this week up in Michigan when we come back. Uh, the Kumars will be sharing with us in all, uh, or both our services. I was about to say in all three services, but that would contradict what I just said. So let's go with two. Uh, they're going to be sharing with us what's happening in the church in India, our brethren church as well. Also, I, we got to show you Emma and Alvin's baptism, Emma and Alvin Sears. Uh, they wanted me to, to pass on their appreciation for your love and your support. Uh, Emma, I was with them yesterday. Emma's uh, condition is not not good. It's getting worse. And so they're um, on a new medication they're trying, but um, she's, she's struggling. So if you think about praying for them, uh, please do. And then Joe caught me right before service and told me there were, uh, at the end of church camp this past week, there were 14 baptisms, which is the most they've ever had at the end of a camp week. So that's pretty amazing. I uh, want to pass that on. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you that you love us and you care for us at a level we don't even understand. You walk with us in the joyous times of our lives. You walk with us through the deepest, darkest valleys of our lives. You are always with us. So help us to turn our attention to you, uh, not to miss out because we're overjoyed and not to miss out because we're heartbroken, but to hear your voice, to feel your presence. And today, help us to hear from you, for we need from you. In Jesus' name, amen.
it's often in a, a service like this that the only time we pay attention to the folks running our technology is when something goes wrong. So the, the projector turns off, the sound gets all wonky, and uh, we think to ourselves, what's going on? Are they going to fix that? And then sometimes we even turn around and be like, hey, so I want to invite you to turn around. I would like our tech group back there in the booth to stand up, please. Do you all stand up? Stand up. Uh, so today there's something else going on back there. You can't maybe tell who all those folks are. Uh, the oldest person running any equipment, you can sit down. The oldest person running any equipment is 17. Yeah, I think that's super. So uh, good job, guys. Thanks. It sounds wonderful, by the way. Excellent. Things are going well. So good job. Uh, a lot of things go on in uh, when you're traveling down the road. Sometimes you get to a place and you, uh, you stop and there might be somebody who has a sign that says, we'll work for food. Uh, I know some places in Akron that I go sometimes, I'll see that. Uh, just the other day I was up by Best Buy and there was a family that said, I think their sign said traveling, but I, I was going the other way, so I was reading it through my rear view mirror, which is hard to do without crashing into the person in front of you. So I was trying to do those both at the same time. And when we see those signs, we might think certain things. Some might think, well, look, uh, this is somebody who's in need and in trouble and I should stop and I should help. Uh, some people feel compelled to do that. Some people decide that um, they should help, but they're not going to, and then they feel guilty later in the day. Uh, still others, their first assumption is this must be a scam. These people must be ripping me off. I'm sure they have a house and a car and a boat and a plane and all that kind of stuff, and they're just sitting out here holding these signs. What I'm getting at is we make assumptions about people when we see them. Uh, Scott shared in first service that he was getting his hair cut one day, and the person cutting his hair didn't know him, and so they're chatting for a while, and eventually the person cutting his hair said, oh, so what do you do? And Scott said, well, I'm a pastor, and that was the last, her question was the last words that she spoke to him. She finished cutting her, his hair, and uh, right? Uh, I've had those experiences where people ask me what I do. Uh, I was at a barber shop when I was in seminary. A guy cutting my hair said to me, Eventually, what do you do? I said, well, I'm actually, I'm in seminary. And he, he yelled to the rest of the people in the barbershop. Um, <laughs> he yelled, oh, guys, shut the blank up. We got a preacher here. <laughs> and up until that time, the blank was happening all over the place, right? If you beeped every time they swore, it would sound like a truck backing up, right? So... Um, and his command to everybody stop doing that lasted about eight seconds, and then it was all back. I've gotten all kinds of things. I knew what I did for a living, and I said who I, what I did, and then they offered me uh, tequila. So, you know, the options are uh, all over the place. But we assume things about people, and we, 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 get, we think, oh, this is how this person should be. Now, Paul is going to say to the older women of the church um, through Titus, right? He's teaching Titus. Titus, tell the older women of the church this is how they should live. And that's what we're looking at in Titus chapter 2, verse 3. It's just the single verse that Paul addresses the older women. He says, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. So we're going to look at these today, just in, in order. The first one is, uh, Paul says to Titus, teach the older women to be reverent. To be reverent. It's a term that was used for uh, the way people were supposed to behave in and around temples in the ancient world. They were to, to operate and uh, sort of live with or, or uh, act with sort of a seriousness about the temple, uh, not so much frivolity. Uh, they were to be focused. I, I know growing up uh, in the church, kids would hear this often, don't run in church. Right? And so there's two reasons people say that. Uh, one is because of a sense of reverence, like this isn't the appropriate place to do that. And so uh, when you're watching your kids play on a soccer field, you don't yell out to them, don't run! Right? When they're playing basketball, don't run! No, it's, it's in this setting, we want you to act a little differently. And, and then the other practical thing is, kids when they run in church knock big people over. Because they're small, they catch at the knees, and right? We don't want injury, right? But the idea that we would operate or behave differently in different settings, Paul says, tell the older women to be serious in their life, right? To have a seriousness about it. That doesn't mean not to enjoy life. That doesn't mean not to have a sense of humor. It means there's a seriousness about life that we all understand. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul wrote, 
Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Verse 9, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. <laughs> Doreen asked me after I read this if, I, if she needs to give up all her rings. <laughs> The point is, Paul's saying to the women of the church in Ephesus at the time, when he's writing 1 Timothy, don't make, women, don't make yourselves, your outward appearance, the focus. Don't distract from worship by uh, the things that you wear, or the displays you have, the elaborate hairstyles, braided hair, various translations have it differently, the gold, all the stuff. That's not the point. You should adorn yourselves with good deeds. You should adorn yourselves with good deeds. So the people are supposed to be living in such a way that others would say, these are people who are doing good all of the time. When the older women of the church are seen, they should be people who are people who are known for their good deeds. We know people like this. We, we know people who do good all of the time. We know people who do it quietly and behind the scenes. And it reflects well, not just on them, but on the Lord himself. So Paul tells Titus, Make sure the older women live reverently. And in this passage, we're going to get two positive and two negative. So we get two and two. We get the first one is positive. The second one is negative. He says, do not slander. Slander is when we uh, talk about people uh, in ways that are tearing them down. Right? It's common for, for us to do this. We use our words to tear people down. We share stories. We uh, make snide remarks and these kinds of things. Uh, sometimes Caitlin, my youngest, and I will watch fails videos. These are on YouTube. You can watch these anytime you want. Well, probably not now would be a good idea. But anyway, anytime you want other than now. And you can pull these things up, and it's video that people, I don't know why they've submitted them, by the way. Uh, they're doing stuff that just doesn't work. So uh, lots of different ones. One that I've seen over and over is somebody has made a cake and they're showing it to the camera. Yes, yeah. It's called gravity. It's strictly enforced even with beautifully built made cakes, right? Or the person who grabs the rope swing and they begin to swing out and either they lose their grip or the rope breaks or they hold on too long. Any of those are, are possibilities. If it's on the fails reel, you know something like that's going to happen. Uh, there are the people who jump bikes. There are people who look at a wide, uh, fairly wide uh, uh, river or stream, and you know they're going to try to jump over it. And if it's on the video, what do you know is going to happen? They're not going to make it, right? And I think two things about those videos. Number one, I'm glad most of my life is not on video. <laughs> right? And secondly, you know, sometimes we watch that stuff and you think, man, I make some pretty good decisions. <laughs> Slander. I get to pass on other things about other people that make me feel good because I'm tearing them down. I'm using my words to make myself feel better. Gossip destroy relationships. Both are not appropriate for the people of God and the followers of Jesus. Have you ever wondered when someone is sharing with you some piece of gossip or some negative thing about someone? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wonder what they say about me when I'm not here? Right? Slander. Paul says to Titus, instruct the older women not to be this way. Paul tells Titus, the older women should be people who aren't doing that. So one of the things, and I shared this on Friday, uh, that I learned about Jan Lehman when I passed on the news last week that she had passed away, how encouraging she was to individuals in the life of this church. People came to me and said, she encouraged me, she would call me, text me, write to me. The worship team folks said these things about her, uh, even going as far as saying that she was kind of like the musical director. She would uh, encourage, but her words were always encouraging. That's exactly the opposite of what slander is. When we use our words to build these others up, when the book of Ephesians says, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is good for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. Our words should be things that are encouraging and uplifting and holding people up. The, the other day I was working on Rebecca's car. Several of us were, Cameron and someone else were all working together on the car. We're doing kind of a minor job, but getting it done. We got it all done, put it back together, but I didn't take it out and drive it. So later in the week, I thought, oh, I should drive it. So I started it up, and a little light came on on the dash that told me the car was overheating. I had just started it. There's no way the car was overheating. And I thought, oh, okay. 
There's something unplugged under the hood. We messed something up. So get up in there. Oh, find it. Not unplugged, but it's probably not plugged in right. Unplug it, replug it in, start up, boom, there it goes. Why does that work? Because the computer in the car monitors all its systems, right? Paul's telling Titus to tell the women, have a mouth monitor on. Right? The words that you say should not be tearing people down. The words that you sh- say should be building others up. Because say, don't, don't destroy people with it. We need that kind of monitoring system. We would always send our, our kids out, you know, when they were playing different sports, we'd say, okay, you got to wear a, a mouth guard. We only started doing that after they got braces. Well, before they got braces, if they got their teeth messed up, then health insurance would cover the repair of their teeth and we could get them straightened out. Like, I'm not dumb. So I thought it was a good idea, right? But after they got braces, it's like, we got five grand in your mouth. You better wear this stupid thing. I don't care if you can't talk. Tell your opponent, I don't care. We're not doing this again. But all of us, one that guards the things that come out of our mouth. Because we can so easily tear people down. But more importantly, it's important for us to build one another up. Paul says, don't let the women be known as slanderers. Uh, The second negative and the third in the list is don't be addicted, right? He says, don't be addicted to much wine. The New Living Translation says they must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Other versions say guide them to be neither gossips nor drunks. The New American Standard says they should not be enslaved to much wine. Now, this seems like an obvious kind of quality, right? Like, why does this have to be on the list? And yet it seems like Paul is dealing with something that's going on in the culture uh, at the time. It it makes it on the list of a number of times related to leaders in the church. In 1 Timothy, uh, there's a discussion about leaders. He says in uh, chapter 3, here's a trustworthy worthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Verse 3, not given to drunkenness. Same passage down to verse 8, talking about deacons. They're to be not indulging in much wine. And then you go to Titus. We already talked about this a number of weeks back, but not given to drunkenness as a description of somebody who's to be an overseer. The Bible clearly says we are not to be people who allow alcohol or really anything else to control us. That's what addiction is. It controls us. Right? We're told to be not drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told to allow the Lord to control us, not something else. When I was in college, I got uh, firsthand experience watching alcohol control people's lives. I watched people wreck relationships. I watched people make horrible decisions. <laughs> I watched somebody accidentally injure themselves under the influence of alcohol. And I watched someone else destroy property under the influence of alcohol. I grew up in a home where alcohol was abused, so I got to see it firsthand and experience that. Living addicted to wine or alcohol or other uh, illicit drugs is allowing something other than the Spirit to control you. And Paul says, that should not be so amongst the older women in the life of the church. His final instruction is this, teach what is good. Teach what is good. Paul wants Titus to tell the older women to be in pre- preparation to be teaching. Now, it, pro- it doesn't necessarily mean formal teaching. All of you have experienced formal teaching, or at least I think you have. Or we'll just ask you a question. Have you ever been in a setting where someone talked at you and you filled in little notes? Anywhere. Anywhere today. Right? Formal teaching. Somebody up here, blah, 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 blah. You go to school. Somebody's teaching, lecturing, te- showing you things, doing math pr- problems, stand on the wall, right? Getting it all done. Teaching kids how to do stuff. Come alongside them and say, no, no, no. Two plus two is four, not five. You got to get all that stuff squared away. Formal teaching. But lots of stuff happens informally. We learn a ton of things while we're doing things with other people who know what they're doing. We have informal teaching settings where something comes up and all of a sudden you have an opportunity to say some things that you didn't plan on saying. You don't have a curriculum. You don't have a a, a course offering you're doing. You're just simply talking. It happened the other day at our kitchen table. I was uh, sitting down. I was starting to talk to Cameron and then Caitlin joined in. And what I had done is I, I wrote on a piece of paper... I had just been looking at our retirement accounts, and I said, uh, I wrote out a piece of paper, I handed him a piece of paper, and I said, he said, what's that, Dad? I said, that's how much money our retirement account made in the last three months. He said, really? 
I said, yes, this is the beauty and magic of compound interest. This is how it works. And then Caitlin came over and we showed her the same thing. And she said, well, really? Yep. So then we got talking about money and finances and retirement. Now, 17 and 14, they're, they're not exactly ready to retire, but they're getting close. So we want to get them thinking about it, right? We talked about the rule of 72. We talked about the 4% rule. We talked about all kinds of stuff like that, about the kinds of things that we have done as a family and things we've not done as a family so that we would have resources to retire and so forth and so on. And we're kind of opening the playbook to them. I didn't plan on talking about any of that to them. It just sort of began to happen, and there was an interest, so much so that Jennifer was in the office area, apparently overhearing what I was doing, and she said, Art, you got to wrap it up. It's getting late. The kids have to go to bed. So, so eventually we did, right? With, with parenting, informal opportunities to teach happen all the time. Somebody does something terrible on the road, and you can say, kids, don't drive like that. That's a terrible idea. When someone does something wonderful, say, isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? The older women in the life of the church are to be instructing the younger women in the life of the church. Next week, we'll talk about some of the specifics Paul gets into, but that's the general idea. For that to happen, there has to be a relationship between the older women and the younger women. The older women and the younger women have to know each other. They have to be able to see each other. The younger women need to see what the older women are doing because so much is taught simply by example. On September 22nd, there's a Brethren Women Retreat. You can head down to Camp Bethany and check out that retreat. There'll be an opportunity to be together, and uh, it would be a chance to get to know some of the women in the life of the church. Paul gives this instruction to Titus, and it requires the older women to invest themselves in the younger women, something we all should be interested in. We have all benefited from the people uh, moving along in the years in front of us, being able to watch and see and listen. We've gained great wisdom and insight from them. And Paul's telling Titus, tell the older women, be intentional about that with the younger women. Because God's desire is that we would grow in faithfulness and in faith throughout the entirety of our lives. And that for our entire lives, we'll be involved in the ministry of the church in one way or another. To the older women, you are to help the younger women as they come along. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you watch over us and you are with us. We thank you for the roles that we get to play, the the opportunities we have to be your witnesses, to both learn from each other and to encourage one another, but also then to pass on the things that we have learned, that we can help those who come behind us to live a life of faithfulness to you. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus, amen. See
God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing Father, just be with us as we leave this place. Strengthen us, encourage us, that we might live for you in each and every moment of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.